Hi everyone, Brian from Sue Generis Brewing here. It is January 19th, 2024, and nine months, 12 days, and roughly six hours ago, I planted a barley crop, which I had hoped would be the beginning of a project where I would produce a beer entirely from ingredients produced on my property. And well, it's been a little while, but we have beer. So if you haven't seen the video series or if you're playing catch up, the Coles Note version is pretty straightforward. Uh, in April 2023, I planted two varieties of barley. One is Harrington. This is a uh, malting grade two row barley from the 80s and 90s. As a child, this is something I kind of dealt with a lot when I was uh, sent out to work on my uncle's farms. The other barley that I grew was something called Bear. This is a six row variety that actually dates back to the Viking Age, if not further. So it's an old land race variety. And we only really still have it today because on the Shetland Islands, farmers grow it for whiskey. So if it wasn't for uh, their desire for a good whiskey, we probably would have lost it. Uh, both of those I malted and uh, obviously used that for brewing. I grew some hops on the property as well, uh, a variety called Canadian Red Vine, which again is an almost extinct land race variety here from Canada. Uh, it's actually a pretty interesting hop, but it really suffers from uh, disease sensitivity, so it's not very popular with hop growers. I isolated wild yeast actually from the bare barley, uh, and even the water that went into this beer came from an almost century old well here on my property. So I called this the 50 meter beer project because I figured I could produce everything within 50 meters of my home. Uh, and that was actually a bit of a hedge because I was worried I wouldn't get much malt or that my malt would be kind of garbage. So at 50 meters, uh, we also include my apiary, but turns out I didn't need that. So maybe this is a 25 meter beer project, uh, but nonetheless, but either way, we have beer. Uh, now, before I go into how this turned out, I thought I would just mention with what I'm doing next in this project. So I kept a fair amount of barley to plant in the spring and I talked to one of my cousins who still farms barley to get some suggestions on how to improve my yields and essentially he kind of looked at what I had done and he said well your barley rows are too far apart and your seeds are too close together so I'm going to try and correct that next year or I guess it's this year uh, as well as do some amendments to the soil but I have decided to only grow bare this year and the reason for that is the Harrington barley even though I have sort of a, a nostalgic connection to it is just a modern malting grade barley uh, so if everything goes perfectly well with that, I would end up producing something no different than what you buy at the brew shop. Uh, bear, on the other hand, is not something that we see very often. It is a unique grain. It has an interesting character that is really something that is unique to it. Uh, so that's what I'm going to focus on growing this year. I'm hoping to grow uh, about three times the air area that I grew last year. And assuming I can get my yields up, I'm hoping that'll be around six times the barley. Uh, which will hopefully give me enough grain this year to do two or three batches rather than just one. Haven't decided yet what I want to do with that. Uh, obviously, it's easy to dream of things to do, but growing enough barley to fill in all those dreams is a little bit more challenging. I'm kind of torn between trying to do sort of a, a classic maltol style Norwegian ale using Kvike, as well as uh, some grain malted in the traditional Norwegian style. This, of course, uh, growing bear would be very similar to the grain that would have been used uh, in more ancient times in Norway. Uh, but alternatively, maybe I should do something along the lines of a cool ship sour because, you know, we're exploring local terroir. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, one thing I think I will do differently this year, though, is I'm not going to make quite as many videos as I did in uh, this particular video series. Uh, as you may have noticed, my output of these is very variable and that has to do with work as well as demands on the farm. And I think it might just be easier to do sort of three or four big updates instead of trying to put out a video every two or so weeks. But that's in the future. What about this stuff here? Well, I think the first thing you might notice is there's a bit of color to this. It's sort of a, a coppery red. And that was somewhat unexpected. Uh, the two grains that I grew I turned into two different malts. My aim with the Harrington was actually to produce just a conventional base malt. Now during malting the Harrington did develop a bit of lactobacillus growth and so when I malted it it malted fine but when I started toasting it uh, it really developed a lot more color than I expected and I don't know if that's because my oven was too hot 
or if something to do with the acidity or the sugars produced by the lactobacillus cause some uh, rapid caramelization. But in either case, that's really where that color came from. The bear I malted more as a uh, brew malt style malt. Uh, and that worked out perfectly. It actually is a really delicious malt. Uh, the biggest challenge of that was not just eating it by the handful. It was really good once it was done. Uh, and so I think next year that's going to definitely be something I'm going to try and repeat uh, with any bear that I happen to get out of my crop. So the hops that I'm using, as I mentioned, are Canadian red vines. Uh, so these are a moderate alpha acid uh, hop. Uh, they are quite proliferative. They produce tons of cones. Um, and they have a very unique character. They have sort of a cherry note to them, which you don't really see in modern hop varieties. They also have a little bit of that more classical North American resinous uh, piney note as well. Uh, but that uh, cherry note, if you use them right, really comes through. As I mentioned, the wild yeast I isolated from the bare barley itself. Uh, and, you know, it's a wild yeast, you can maybe tell here, it didn't drop very clear. That's very typical of wild yeast. But actually, as wild yeast go, this one was pretty mild. Um, this is, you know, more uh, more yeast character than you would get from, like, a Chico strain or a lager strain. Um, but it's not really any more dramatic than an English ale strain, and it certainly isn't pushing into Belgian yeast territory or Saison territory. Uh, and much to my surprise, it is a, a, a phenolic off flavor positive yeast. But there's very, very little of that character in the actual finished beer. Um, so, you know, it's actually quite a, quite a nice yeast other than the, the fact that it just won't settle out. Uh, and then the water, as I mentioned, came from an old well on my property. I have no idea what the mineral profile of it is. Uh, we had it tested, but the testing is to check for pesticides and for uh, nasty bacteria. And it doesn't have pesticides or nasty bacteria in it, but what minerals may or may not be there, I, I really don't know. So that's sort of the, the background, but what about the beer itself? What does this thing look like or taste like? So the first thing, obviously, is it is a little hazy because that yeast doesn't want to settle. It's got a nice copper color. It's maybe not obvious here, um, but it actually does have a pretty good and resistant head. Uh, the reason why this has kind of fallen is I actually overcarbonated the cake because I, for some reason, decided to try natural carbonation with this batch. Uh, and so it was massively overcarbonated, and I've now kind of gone too far in the other direction. But when it's appropriately carbonated in port, you get a nice, pretty rocky head on it, and you can kind of see some of the Belgian lacing here, uh, which sort of shows you that it, it does actually like to linger around. So appearance-wise, other than the cloudiness, it's, it's a, a quite a nice looking beer. And aroma-wise, it's actually pretty subdued. You know, it, it has sort of that malty aroma, uh, nothing too distinct. You know, it obviously wouldn't have any roasty aromas or anything like that. It's just sort of your classic, sort of almost malty lager-like uh, aroma to it. And in the background is the cherry note uh, from the Canadian Red Vines. Uh, so it is actually a very pleasant smelling beer. And the taste itself as well is really good. Uh, the, the malt character reminds me of sort of an English style uh, pale ale. Uh, so, you know, an English style beer without too much crystal malt added to it, but it's, you know, got a fair amount of malt backbone to it. Um, it is a nice full malt note. I don't know if that's because of the bear or the malting process or what, but it is a really nice malt background. The cherry character of the hops is quite predominant, um, especially once that malt flavor starts to drop down. Uh, and it, it's cherry-ish. It isn't pure cherry. Uh, it's really hard to describe, um, but it's, it's, it's very nice. It actually reminds me of sort of the cherry note that uh, some strains of Britannomyces can leave in a beer. It's, it's not too different from that, but obviously without the funky aspect to it. It's really that pure sort of cherry fruit character. Uh, much to my surprise, especially given how these hops smell when you have them in the bag, there's very little of that resiny note. And it's probably because I used a fairly subdued amount of hops, especially in the flavor and aroma additions, because I really didn't want this to be a hop bomb. I wanted to sort of get a taste of everything. Uh, the yeast, of course, are a little bit estery, so you get 
what I would consider to be kind of classic English style esters in here, uh, which really helped to actually accentuate that cherry note. It, it's really quite a pleasant, mildly fruity ale. I mean, if you gave this to me, didn't tell me what it was, I would think it's, again, some sort of an, an English style ale with subdued crystal malt notes. The aftertaste, I mean, it's a very light beer. It's, I think, 4.2% alcohol, give or take. Um, so obviously it's it's not a big and cloying beer. It's actually pretty light on the tongue. The aftertaste uh, disappears fairly quickly and it's just sort of a, a sweet multi note, little hint of cherry. Um, really all around actually surprisingly good beer. I'm, I'm really pleased with how this came out, especially since at a lot of points along the line, I really felt like I was pulling this out of my ass. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it turned out really good considering what I started with and considering that along the ways I was basically learning how to do all these new to me things in terms of how do you malt thing, malt grain, how do you get grain ready for malting, how do you deal with it afterwards, trying to predict hop bitterness levels and things like that so that it was reasonably balanced and it's okay. There is, from my opinion, one big flaw and that flaw is that my assumptions about bitterness were off. Uh, I don't remember the exact range that red vines are supposed to fall in. If you really care, it's in one of my previous videos. Uh, but I sort of assumed that I would be kind of middle of the road on there and that's what I hopped based on. And I sort of figured, you know, if I'm below that, it should still balance out okay. If I'm above that, it would just be a little bit more like an IPA rather than a pale ale. But I think actually the, the bitterness of these hops is way lower than sort of what commercial expectations are. And so the amount of bitterness here is, is way too low. Um, you know, and because of that, it's a relatively sweet tasting beer. Uh, it really could use probably double the IPUs to bring it into what I would consider a more balanced flavor. Um, when I was designing this, what I had in mind was sort of a, an American style or Belgian style pale ale. Uh, and I'm more towards maybe something like a mild in terms of the hop to malt balance. But that is really the only thing I would change about how this turned out. Uh, other than that, I mean, the malt flavor is fantastic. The yeast character is great. I like these hops. And even though it's missing a bit of that resiny note, the fruity character really complements the yeast and the malt well. It's quite nice. It's just, it could use a touch more bitterness. And by a touch more, I mean about twice as much bitterness uh, to basically balance all of that out. It's a little on the sweet side for my taste. But, you know, for the first time I've ever made my own malt in the quantities needed to actually brew a beer with it, uh, for the first time that I've ever grown the grain that I've used to make my own malt, uh, and for the first time ever using my own homegrown hops entirely in a recipe instead of relying on a known commercial hop for bittering, it turned out really good. I'm quite happy with this and I'm excited, well, it's this year now, but uh, in the next growing season, to do this again but to try something a little bit different and to try and push things in a different direction. So anyways, if you watched the whole series, thank you so much for sticking with me for so very long. Like I said at the beginning, it's been nine months and essentially 13 days. It's almost midnight here, so it's been almost nine months and 13 days. Uh, and so if you stuck with me for all this time, I mean, thank you so much. If you're just catching up on the videos now, uh, the, you know, I'll put the playlist of the whole thing up here, you know, pick and choose as you see fit. Uh, I think the malting episode uh, is probably the best one, mostly because I screw up here and there and it's kind of funny to watch. Uh, but, you know, it's been a great time and thank you everyone who joined me on this journey and I hope that you will join me uh, in my upcoming journey. Uh, I should also add at this point, I have a couple other series that I have been working on very slowly behind the scenes. Uh, and I'm hoping for some of those, at least one of those series to come out in the next couple of months. So if, again, uh, keep an eye out for those as well if you're interested. Uh, in particular, I've got a, a three-part series on Solaris coming up. Uh, so hopefully that's something some of you will find interesting. Uh, so once again, I'm Brian from Sui Generis Brewing. Thank you so much for joining me, and I hope to see you in future videos.